and welcome into another edition of Oh Mama, a look back at the 2008 Steel Curtain Defense High. I'm Chris Mack. This video series available to you every single episode on the 93.7 The Fan YouTube page. All the way back to our first two episodes with the man who was one of the architects of this defense, Dick LeBeau. Up through the most recent episodes with Chris Hope, James Ferrier, and we keep it in the middle of the defense this week, brought to you by South Hills Kia, with a guy who really didn't know what it was like to be an understudy, whether it was in high school or college or the pros. Wherever he went, he started almost right away, and he made an impact. Certainly helped his teammates make an impact as well. And pleased to be joined on this episode of Oh Mama, look back at the 2008 Steel Curtain defense by the man who was literally in the middle of it all. We had James Ferrier last week who was in the middle, but the man who was right at the front of it, spearheading the thing in effect, at least when it came to eating up the opposition's blockers, joins me, Casey Hampton. Casey, thanks so much for taking the time today. We really appreciate it. Man, I so appreciate you having me, man. Happy to, happy to share some of these memories with you. Yeah, you know, we've uh, we've talked to guys who, in some cases, you know, it, they, they kind of look back on it with a little bit of a haze. Like, I talked to Hokey a couple weeks ago, and he's like, well, I remember this, but I don't remember what happened here and what led to it. But And then you talk to, like, someone like Coach LeBeau, who's got a steel trap for a memory. That man remembers everything. Um, yeah. So he's he still remembers a lot. And, and everybody's somewhere on the spectrum in between, but – it's a good time with it 15 years in the rear view to look back on that last Steelers Super Bowl championship. And the last one of the last few times the Steelers had a, a defense that was able to drag a team kicking and screaming to a championship. Although you guys certainly had Ben on the other side of the ball in those years. I want to start a little earlier than that, though, um, because I've done this with just about everybody. I start with before you got to Pittsburgh for just a brief moment and. We were just talking before we hit record. Um, we have we, uh, the origins of our families come from a very similar place. My family comes from from Texas, South Texas, in some instances, all over the place. But you grew up in Galveston, um, Ball High School graduate, in 1996. And um, just what what was football for you as a kid growing up? Um, what did it mean to you? What got you into football? And what led you down the path to eventually, you know, ending up in Austin at UT? Well, um, I think down in Galveston, um, it's a little bit different. You know, um, I think growing up, football is everything. Mm -hmm. I remember, um, like, it's, it's like one of those cities where the whole city shuts down when when it's, when it's football time. And I think um, the, the football legacy from back then started a lot, lot earlier for me because we had so many guys from Galveston playing in the NFL. I think when I was in, like, high school, we probably had nine guys in the NFL at one time. Like it was, it was, it was just crazy. So, I think the mentality back then for me was a lot of guys say, "Well, I'm gonna go to college or I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this and that." I, I think like at a young age, going to the NFL was reality, and that's and that's how I kind of I kind of looked at it. So I kind of looked at it a little bit different, and I think people from down there look at it a little bit different than kind of a whole lot of other different places. So what's it like when you get an opportunity to go to UT um, and uh, go be a part of a program that, for the most part, over the last 50, 60, 70 years has been sort of a standard bearer? Yeah, they've had their little ups and downs, their dips here and there. Um, but w when you get that opportunity, w what's that like? And then you go there and you start. I, I want to say you play near, almost every game as a freshman, right? True freshman. Yeah, I played. I played a lot. I started. I actually started after like the third game, fourth game, my freshman year. Um, you know, I, it was it was it was eventually going to happen. But you know, it, it was it was a, it was a big deal, man. You know, I grew up. It's kind of it's funny. Is uh, I grew up a, a Texas A&M fan. Okay. You know, they had Patrick Bates. You know, they had the wrecking. He's from Galveston, big time safety. They had the wrecking crew back then, so that was a thing. Like I loved A&M. So, but um. I, I, when an opportunity to come to Texas, man, they get you down on that campus in Austin. It's over with. It, it, <laughs> you, can't, you can't say no to that, man. It's it's, it's a different type of experience. As a whole, it's a whole different deal down there. So, I was excited. They sent that private plane down there to Galveston, picked me up at the at the airport. I was sold. It was a wrap. Oh, all of a sudden, Giggum turns into Hookum real quick. 
yeah. You already know, for real. So it was, it was a little bit different. Um, okay, so you're uh, you're a four year starter at UT, uh, first team All American in 2000, Big 12 Defensive Player of the Year, um, and you start to earn this reputation as a guy who just can't be single blocked. You become a, a guy that they've got to put at least two blockers on you. And you come out in the first round, you get drafted by the Steelers. And as it happened so often towards the end of the Bill Cowher era, and then even early in the Mike Tomlin era, a first round guy comes in, I'm thinking in your case, or about a decade later in the case of say Marquise Pouncey, they come in, and it doesn't take long at all for you to win the job um, to supplant Kendrick Clancy as the starter at nose tackle. So just what was it like coming to Pittsburgh the first time, meeting Bill Cower, and um, I, I guess becoming a part of an organization that you grow up in Texas, everybody's a little more Cowboys focused probably, but you come to you come to Pittsburgh and it's like the Steelers are it. They're the thing. It was, it was crazy, man, because I, I still have a great history. And, um, you know, people, Texas. I grew up in that, so I wasn't a Cowboys fan. I can't stand Cowboys fans. My whole family <laughs> growing up. But anyway, that's a whole that's a whole other story. But uh, so I really didn't know the history of the Steelers. You know, um, of course I know I, I know Mr. Green. You know, who, who don't know who don't know him and, and some of the great defensive players. But I just didn't know the the great history. I know he used to beat the Oilers all the time back in the day. Yeah, you know, <laughs> so I, I know I know that aspect of it. So it was just a different experience, and it was just fun. Um, getting there and learning the history and learning and learning the Super Bowl they won and, and how great the defenses were and things like that. So it was a big learning experience for me coming in and, and just learning traditions and things like that of, of, of the Steelers. What, what's it like, I guess, coming up alongside? Now, you you step in as a starter right away, um, but you come in around the same time as Chris Hoke, who I mentioned I talked to a couple weeks ago. He's a lot older than you, right? Because he goes to BYU, does the mission trip and all that. He's a little more maybe settled right family at home and you two are coming up at the same time you've got chemo there as well chemo von olhoffen as as someone who's not playing nose tackle but is sort of an elder statesman on the defensive line um what's it like for you guys coming up together under that leadership and um just what did you learn i guess early on from the older guys who either were playing or even even older guys like Hokey who weren't necessarily playing you were playing the same position as him well, I think I think mainly, man, especially with the D line, man, we had a great coach, right? So, I mean, having Coach Mitch, and that that's first and foremost, man. He taught you things the right way. You he made you do things the right way, and I think that, and I think his ways trickle down to guys like Aaron Smith, right? So, you know, Kimo was an outlier. He came from a different team, so he was already a veteran guy. So he was kind of just, you know, he would do his own thing. He would do it effectively, but. It was kind of listening to chemo. You know, of course, I did. You know, chemo was going to tell you to do it, how to get it done, but not the right way, right? So, but anyway, it, it was it was cool just learning things in different ways, and um and 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 learning different aspects of things of how to do things the right way and how to do things ways of getting it right by chemo and things like that. So it kind of it showed me um it balanced me out um. I guess I get, I get it balanced me out as far as I I, do, I I could I could handle any kind of situation right it it it, it really didn't matter but I think the main thing was trickling down from Coach Mitch and and teaching the guys a certain way to do things and guys following him I think that was a, I think that was a big deal it's ex- expand a little bit more if you don't mind on on Coach Mitchell because I think people throughout the years associate the Steelers obviously with defense and you mentioned. Joe Green earlier and the defenses, the steel curtain defenses of the seventies. And then you get to the Bill Cower era and people associate it with Blitzburg, right. And edge rushers, outside linebackers, but at the core, if you don't have the guys up front, you mentioned Aaron Smith, um, you know, chemo for a while, then it becomes Brett Kiesel. You and Aaron Smith and Brett Kiesel, I think started together on that line seven or eight consecutive years. Um, and you come up under coach John Mitchell, um, how much, how much did he have, I guess, what was his influence? And then how, how important was it that the three of you stayed together as you did? People talk about chemistry on an offensive line. How important was it for you three to have chemistry on the defensive line? I mean, I think, I think that was everything. I think, and I think 
it wasn't just me, Kiesel, and Aaron. It was Hokey. It was that I played with Hokey for eleven years. Uh, Kersky, I played with him probably eight years. Uh, um, it was it was just so many guys who just came in, and, and we were just a group. And I think that um, Mitch just did a great job of keeping us together, making guys understand their roles and what their roles was were, and just having everybody ready to play and ready to do the right thing. You know, like it was like everybody was interchangeable. Like you know what I'm saying? Like when when the next it, the the D line next guy up thing was really a thing. Like when Hokey came in, nobody was looking for no drop off. Hokey was gonna get the job done. Mm-hmm. When Kersey came in for Aaron or he so it was they were gonna get the job done. You know what I'm saying? That was just that was just the standard. Like and 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 it was it was true and it was true the whole time that that we were there. So I mean, playing with those guys, man, it it you you can't you can't put no, you can't put nothing on playing with those type of guys for that for that period of time. You know, those guys are like brothers and you and you build a certain type of relationship and you play different. For those type of guys, you can just look at Aaron and know what he's thinking. Or look at Keith and know what he's thinking. Just playing for those, playing with those guys for so long. So that was a great experience, man. Those guys are still great friends, great friends of mine to this day. So the the on field experience is going through 2004, Ben's rookie year, right? You guys, I mean, go on an absolute tear, um, all the way to the AFC Championship game, which has been a big topic of conversation the last month or so with Jerome saying some things about New England on Ben's podcast. But we all know, at least in this neck of the woods, what probably went down in the 2004 AFC Championship game. 2005 comes around. It's more difficult for you guys to get into the playoffs. But once you're there, you go on a run again. You go up up to Detroit for Super Bowl 40, the celebration of Bussy and all that. Um, how did all of that coming up together, going through 2004 and the loss at home to the Patriots, actually getting there to Super Bowl 40 in 2005 and winning it, how did that foundation sort of lay things down for then you come you come into 2008 and I don't want to say been there, done that, but you guys have, have seen just about everything you can see at that point. Yeah, we, we, we definitely did. But I think that um, the disappointment of the years before were kind of similar, right? Like, mm-hmm. yeah, felt like we had had a good enough team to get it done and just fell short. So I think that bad taste in your mouth that, that let it was kind of the same bad taste from that first Super Bowl to that and going to that second one that we had the year before. You know, we didn't want to do that again. And I, I think that having a lot of the same guys that had felt that before kind of helped us help helped us a lot in that process. What what's it like? Because you talk about the year before in 2004's case, I laid it down. You, you AFC Championship loss to the Patriots. You bounce back in 05, win the Super Bowl in 2008. It, the year before had been Coach Tomlin's rookie year as a head coach, and you lose to Jacksonville in the wild card game. A number of guys have mentioned how difficult that first training camp was under Mike Tomlin because he came in and he wanted to set a tone as, yeah, I'm a young head coach. I'm not far off in age from you guys, but I'm going to put you through your paces, and I, I want to reinforce what's going to be necessary and that it kind of ate away at, at, at you guys throughout the course of the year. Um, what is how, how difficult was 2007, I guess, to get used to this new young hotshot head coach who comes in and have him trying to earn your respect uh, and then getting to where, where you were in the playoffs and, and losing that game at home to Jacksonville? I mean, he definitely, he definitely came in and put his imprint on the team. Um, with the toughness, you know, with the tough practices and and the tour days, consecutive things like that, you know. But I mean, we built for that kind of stuff, though. Like, you know, what I'm saying, like, of course, it, of course, we embraced it at the time. We 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 were like, we really didn't need it, but of course, we're gonna embrace it and do what we need to do. But I definitely think it it, it definitely wore us down toward the end of the season. You know, what I'm saying, playing up, playing a long season, going to the Super Bowl, and playing the physical style of play that we play we going to play physical. Like, that's just how we play the game. So I think that that pair with how physical we play, I think it wore us down, man. But that's no excuse, dude. It was just, it was, it was just tough at the end, man. And um, I, I felt like we felt like we had a, a good enough team to go and not being able to finish the job. I think that was just, that was the most disappointing part of it. So you come into 2008 camps, not, quite as difficult as it was the year before Mike T doesn't lean on you guys quite as much um, as he did in that first year. 
But what what's do you guys have an expectation? I know Coach LeBeau, and he, he was pretty detailed on how he explained it, would lay down certain numbers that he wanted you guys to hit, like keep the opponent below this number of yards or this number of points. And those were the benchmarks for success, right? And what what was the expectation, like you said, knowing that you fell a little short in 07, uh, but knowing that you're also only three years removed from a Super Bowl, and the team really hasn't changed all that much. Yeah, new head coach. Yeah, you've lost a, a guy or two here and there, like PZ had left and gone off to Miami. Um, but for the most part, that team, with a couple of young reinforcements like Timmons and Woodley and Will Gay, that team is, for the most part, the same team that went to Super Bowl forty. It was the same team, man, but, you know, it, it, it was definitely different, man. You, Wood was unproven. You know, um, Debo, you know, he he had a great season that season, but you, you was, he was great, but you wouldn't think he was going to do that. You know what I mean? So I think that um, we knew we had um, a chance to be a, a really great defense, a really great defense, man. But I, I think legendary, like, like how great we were, I think was a little surprise. I, I was a little surprising to me. I thought we would be great, but like how great we were, historically great, that was a little bit different, man. Like you got to be clicking on all cylinders to play that way for a full season. So everybody, nearly everybody has told me that there were times where, and it, it, this feeds into the success, this feeds into the sort of brotherhood that you talked about earlier that existed on the field. It's because a lot of what happened off the field, uh, because you guys were so close knit. That Monday nights you'd get together. Maybe there's some wings. Maybe there's some film. There's a Monday night game on Thursday nights. Everybody's getting massages, getting ready for the weekend. The you talk about the familial aspect of of that team. Uh, you guys being together so often, um, but it leads to that brotherhood. And as some people have talked about it, it also leads to you guys would get into each other sometimes. Like in the midst of a game, I've had a couple people say. You know, officials are looking at us, kind of side-eyeing us, like, are we supposed to break up a fight between teammates? Because these guys look like they're about ready to throw down. That's, hey, man, that's <laughs> us all day, dude. That is, that. <laughs> I mean, but that's, but like, that's like when you have a brother, like, and y'all are really brothers and you're really close, like, I can tell you anything or I can say mm -hmm. anything to you and it's nothing that I can say to you that you think is, is going to be malicious, right? Like I, I'm, I'm just telling you as a brother, like to do this, to do that, like you know what I mean. And, and I know I'm, I'm the most complaining, crying, and bitching about everything. Like I'm, I'm, I'm like the one, like I'm always doing that. It's nothing for, for a uh, Patsy to turn around and say, "Ham, hey, shut your fat ass up!" Like I'll <laughs> stop all that crying. You all like you all was crying. Turn around um, and play. Like, and, but, but that was like. That's how we were, though. Like, you know what I'm saying? We, we were cool like that with each other. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah, Larry cites it. Larry Foote, uh, a few episodes ago, cited it as, it as sort of an inborn sense of accountability, right? Because you can say anything to each other. You can, you know, Ike can blow a coverage, walk to the sideline, get chewed out by Farrier, and then five minutes later, it's all good. We're right back out there. Um, at, which I, I, I asked James Farrier about it, and he said, yeah, that, that was pretty unique to that set of guys like he didn't play on a lot of other teams obviously but you know that guys who have experiences outside of the Pittsburgh Steelers and that group in particular can't say the same Larry Foote says I can't get guys to for example hang out with each other now as he coaches in Tampa the way they did the way you guys did back then he's got to yell at guys to get off their phones and actually go out and do something together or be with each other in order to build that, that in, in, uh, innate sense of chemistry. Um, it's, it's just, it's, it's something I've heard from absolutely everybody who talks about that defense. See, and, and what's crazy with me is, is, is I've only been one place. Mm -hmm. So everything I've seen is that. So every, but, but everybody who's, and but the unique thing about it is we've had several guys come back who's been in Pittsburgh mm -hmm. who came who went to another team and came back to Pittsburgh and they was just like it's just totally totally different like like they can't believe like how guys like how guys are and how guys are to themselves how selfish guys are it's just it, 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 it's, it's crazy to me like you know what I mean and and even when guys come on our team 
they have to like adjust and be like these guys are really genuine like these guys really like like each other like they like they cool like you know what i mean so right. i think from that aspect man that, that just made us so different and i can't say that i just i i really thought when i was playing everybody was like that until i started getting the feedback like nah man this this is special here it's, it's different here you know what i mean yeah, so you go into 2008, and you guys fairly rip through the regular season. Like, you start off hot, 4-1, and 5-1. and one. I think you're 6-3 and three through 10 games. Last seven games of the season, you hold opponents to uh, less than 12 points a game. Um, I think you went 6-1 and one down the stretch. Only loss was down in Nashville. Keith Bullock stomping on the towel. We see how that worked out for the Titans. Yeah. Um, and then you get into you get into the playoffs, and the Chargers come to town. A little bit of a fight against the Chargers, but before you know it, it's the AFC Championship game. It's at Heinz Field, and the Ravens of all people are coming to town. Um, what's what, what's a Steelers Ravens game like for those that will never play in one? Just how next? Let now you you played a position that was very physical by its own nature to begin with, but. How much different is a Steelers Ravens matchup, especially when both of those teams then were at the peak of their powers? You know, you always hear the thing we don't like them, they don't like us. Now, of course, that's obvious, but it's just, it's more like, it's hard to explain, man. It's like the game is so physical, man. It's like you get everybody wants all that extra. Like, you know, like a lot of times you play people, you, they'll block you, the whistle blows, you know, the plays over. Just, but like the Ravens game is like, they you it's like I'm not gonna stop till you stop. Like, you know what I'm saying? It's like you're not gonna get the last, like it's just every play is like intense like that. Like you don't want them to get nothing from you, like you don't want them to beat you at nothing. It's just it's like that with everybody else, man. But with the Ravens, it's just so different. And you know the game that much is, more. And you know the game, and, and and for me, you know the game is gonna be physical. You know they're gonna run the ball. You know we gonna you, you, like you know what you're gonna get like you know it's gonna be a physical game and that's and that's football I think that's that's what Pittsburgh was built on I think that's just football and I think that's that's what make that rivalry so great it's it's not a glam game it's gonna be it's gonna be ugly every single time so that game you guys jump out to like a thirteen nothing lead which would seem to seal the deal but the Ravens come storming back you're up by two sixteen fourteen with about nine and a half minutes left, end up punting the ball back to the Ravens, just under seven minutes left. And it's that moment that happened more often than not at Heinz Field where it gets kind of quiet for a second, but then all of a sudden the scoreboard goes dark and it goes, oh, mama. And I heard, I heard that there was a time, Casey Hampton, where you thought that song was cursed. Hey man, it's like every time it came on, <laughs> I'm not lying to you, dude. It was like, please stop playing that, dude. Every time they played it, we would mess it up, dude. <laughs> you it heard, brought, you, it heard, brought you out heard, the best in the other guys, too, right? You've heard that though? Like guys say that. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It took it took a it took a while for that to stick, man. I was like, damn, every time they play that damn song, like they get a first down and get a damn touchdown, man. Like it's crazy. Well, that night, it seems to have worked because five plays after they play Renegade, Troy is kind of sits back because his guy, he's in man coverage on Todd Heap and Heap's in the backfield. Uh, Coach LeBeau told me he's on the sidelines just shaking his head going, I can't believe I got Troy in man coverage on Heap. And Heap's just standing there. Uh, but Tro he said Troy was smart enough. Red Flacco's eyes, jumps on the slant, takes it to the house. And the other thing that everybody almost to a man has said about that play is that when you guys go back and watch it on film later, it's one of the few plays where it feels like something like there's an earthquake happening because the video is shaking like this because it was that loud at Heinz field ever loudest, it, loudest it's ever been. i like, I don't remember a lot, but <laughs> Like that was the loudest I've ever heard that stadium before. It was like, un but it was like crazy. And I wasn't in, I was on the side, so like I'm, I'm I got a front row, a real front row seat, like watching and seeing it. That issue was unbelievable, dude. Like it, and like you say, man, it felt like it felt like the shit was rumbling, like it was crazy, yeah. like you know I mean? like it was it was it was a it was a different experience, man. Definitely different. 
So, and, and this is, uh, I've mentioned this to multiple people. I, before I sat down and went over everything from that year again in my head and went through notes and stuff, um, I didn't realize that when Baltimore gets the ball back, it's only a few plays later. Now, the game feels like it's effectively decided after Troy's pick six, right? You guys are up 23-14. I think there's six and a half minutes left. But a few plays later, the Ryan Clark Willis McGahee collision happens, which is it, it, when we talk, Casey, when we talk Steelers Ravens football, I don't know if there's a moment in the rivalry, other than maybe Haloti not a bust in Ben's nose. Uh, I don't know if there's a moment in the rivalry that more perfectly exemplifies what Steelers Ravens is about than that collision. Potsy, James Ferrier told me. It, it's the loudest hit he's ever heard. And it happened right over his shoulder. So he was right there for it. Um, what What do you remember thinking at that point? To be honest, man, like seriously, I thought one of them was going to be like gone. Like that, That it, it was like, it was bad. bad intent. It was like, un, like, dude, you had to be out there to see it. Dude. Like that, that shit was like, you know how, you love to see hits and you see your body, somebody hit somebody, you get fired up. Mm -hmm. It was like scary. Right. Like, you know what I'm saying? It, it, it was so hard. It was such a a, a big collision. This shit was scary, man. Like, it, it was crazy. Like, but one thing about it, man, RC, either either he going to come out the game or they going to come out the game every time he go in there. So, and, and, and I would, and that's the type of safety that I want playing for me. Like, he, he don't have no, no regard for his body. He gonna go in and give it every time, and he gave it up right there, man. And he, that was unreal, dude. So you close the game out, and now you're headed to Super Bowl Forty Three. It's down in Tampa. Um, there's it, it, there's a sense I think when people look back on it, Casey, to think, oh, they played the Cardinals. Yeah, it was the Cardinals. Well, this is a Hall of Fame Cardinals team. This is Kurt Warner. This is Larry Fitz. This is Anquan Bolden, Steve Breston, Edgerin James. Um, when, as you're getting prepared for that game, what's your mindset going into it? And how much, like I mentioned earlier, is the preparation that you went through in 2005 now able to help lay the foundation for 2008? Um, I think it was more so for me, man, it's more so like a finished job type of deal. Okay. I mean, I think it was more so like we're historically great defense, right? And like, we can't go out here and not finish because we're not going to be looked upon like that right you know and so I, I think it was more of a type of deal like we can't go out there and mess this up like of course I, we always go out there feeling like we're going to win the game or we're going to dominate but I, I felt like we didn't dominate but I wanted to be a dominant I wanted to go out there and dominate and leave no doubt you know what I'm saying that was my mindset going into the game so late in the first half Cardinals have a chance to go up going into the half and James Harrison as he would do sometimes, doesn't do as he's told, um, drops instead of blitzes <laughs> and ends up pick, reading Kurt Warner and picking him off. And now we're moving. We're heading down the field. And I guess what's your reaction when you see it happen and as it develops? Because it takes a while, right? It takes a good 10, 15 seconds for this thing to play out as James Harrison's dodging guys, jumping over guys, falling into the end zone. What are you thinking as you're watching it happen? Well, when he first picked it off, I, I was going crazy. Like, I, I really couldn't see everything, and everybody was going crazy. But as he's running, and I'm I'm seeing him by the shade, I'm like, and I'm thinking to myself, like, get a ball to shade, get a ball to shade. Like, when the shade trying to grab yeah. the ball from his hands. And then when he went down the sideline, and I can actually see the whole picture of it, I was, I was like, man, he really got action. Like, he really <laughs> like he really got action when he was running down the like, running down the sideline. So I'm I'm going down, I'm going crazy. And I'm like, man, he really got action. And dude, when he went in that end zone, dude, I, it was it was just like an unbelievable feeling, man, because that was that was like so huge of a turning point of a of a point change in the game. Like, you know what I'm saying? That's really the yeah. game. Like, you know what I'm saying? So if it, it was it was like I was thinking the the thing I thought, man, first thing I thought when I see him get open field, he got action. And I couldn't believe he, they let him get the end zone on that play. Uh, yeah, it's a 14 point swing. Like, like you said, it's, it goes from being down four at halftime to being up uh, by 10. And um, it, it is, uh, it's just, it, it's 
it, it, like I said, it's typical James Harrison that he didn't quite want to listen, but it ended up working out for him in the end because that's James Harrison. Um, but now it's to your point that that that's the play of the game, at least for the first 59 and a half minutes or so. But it, it's it's the it's the fourth quarter now. It's late in the fourth quarter. You guys are up by a touchdown. I think everybody's feeling good. And Warner ends up hitting Larry Fitz for that one where he hits the seam and takes off. And this is now, to your point, one of the best defenses in Steeler history, standing on the sideline, having to watch with the potential that you go out playing one of the all-time great games but you don't end up on top because of an offensive play by the other team. Just what's the, is it a sinking feeling on the sideline? What is it? I can't believe we tricked this shit off. I cannot believe <laughs> like we tricked this off. Like, like that's the last thing that we thinking, like we going to be, the, we going to be the reason that it happened. And it was just like, it was, it was really humbling on the cool like because we had played so well, like, and really thought we really had it. Like, you know what I'm saying? It was like, we, we couldn't believe it. Like, we couldn't believe we let that happen. It was just like, it was like an out-of-body experience. Was, I like, just could not damn believe it. You know what I mean? So when Ben gets the ball back, um, down 23-20, like 245-ish left, 247, I think, is the exact time. Um, and there's, <laughs> this is after a holding call in the end zone and everything else. Um, are, are as you're watching that drive, are you are you thinking to yourself, okay, yeah, this is this is Ben. This is what he does. He's going to make it happen. Um, and then when San Antonio makes the catch in the end zone, are you watching the scoreboard? Are you are you trying to watch from field level? And do you think, okay, it's Tone. He got it. Or are you going? I don't I'm know. I'm definitely looking. I'm sitting. I'm sitting on the back of the fence, of course. That's that's why I watch it from. And I because you can't really see on on the field like that. So I'm I'm seeing him go down. And the first thing I thought, I seen him catch it, but I, I, I didn't think he had his feet in. Right. Like, it is like it's his feet in. But when I seen the, the referee go with his hands up, man, dude, like I, 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 dude, I went absolutely berserk. Like I went absolutely berserk. I couldn't believe it, dude. Like it was, it was unbelievable. Like it, like that feeling right there was, like they done bet, like they bailed us out of this shit. I can't believe this. Like, like. That's that's the shit that we really really need. You know what I mean? Is that I mean that's peak Ben, right? Like that's exactly what Ben Roethlisberger was built for was to have two and a half minutes left in a Super Bowl, and you know have a holding call on the first play of the drive, and now have to go nearly ninety yards or whatever it was, but somehow throws an absolute dime to a guy who makes the greatest leap and greatest catch of his career, and it all happens on the same play. Ben going around, moving around, throwing the ball into some uh, some coverage he ain't even supposed to throw it. <laughs> I'm that's Ben though, and yeah. and make a perfect throw, and 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 Santonio makes a perfect catch. Like that is Ben career really in a nutshell. Like that's 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 his game. Like you know what I'm saying? It it it, it never can surprise you with him. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um. So I I have a, a stat and I. I I'm glad I came prepared for Coach LeBeau with this stat, but even he didn't realize this. Um, there are four Steelers defenses in the history of the organization that have ranked first in the league in both yards against and points against in the same season. Only one of them was actually one of those 1970s steel curtain defenses. It was 1976, actually, a year they didn't win the Super Bowl. Um, didn't they? Didn't they give up? That's. That's the year they gave up uh, 28 points in the last nine games. Yes, yes. That's the that's the year they were otherworldly, but Franco Harris and Rocky Blyer both got hurt, couldn't play in the AFC Championship game. They lost to the Raiders, who ended okay. up going on to win the Super Bowl. Um, the other three Steelers defenses to accomplish that feat, first in the league in points and yards allowed, were 2004, the team that went 15-1, and one, lost to the Patriots. 2011, the team that lost to the Packers, or the year after the team lost to the Packers in the Super Bowl. 2008, sandwiched right there in the middle, the team that we're talking about right now. And so many of you, including yourself, Casey, were a member of all three of those teams with Coach LeBeau as the, the defensive coordinator. Um, how does that does how does that alter your perspective, if if at all, or 
or what do you think when you think back on those years, like we talked about at the beginning, six, seven, eight years of the same three guys on the defensive line, the same guys playing the same positions for the most part, year after year after year. Um, what's that all, when you put that all together in such a, a great statistical performance three times over the course of eight seasons, what's that mean to you to be a part of that? Uh, that's that's a humbling deal, dude. Like, I never really even thought about I knew we, we had, like, we were really, really good. But, like, and for the steel curtain defenses back then, and you say it's four defenses, and they only had one and we had three. Mm -hmm. It's, like, that's, like, crazy, man. Like, that's that's crazy, man. But, I mean, but, but that, but those group of guys and the way LeBeau put us together, and the way and the way we play together, I just I just don't see. I mean, you all we always talk about tradition and we talk about um, you know doing things the Steelers way and things like that, man. But no, we did it that way, man. That shit, it was different, dude. It, it was different. I, the brotherhood we had. I think that guys. I think that guys, even like with Patsy, I played with Patsy for eleven years. Mm -hmm. You got to think, I played with Brett Kiesel for 11 years, Hokie 11 years, uh, Aaron Smith. Like, like that's not going to happen again. No. You know what I'm saying? Troy Troy for like eight years. Like, that's it's just not going it, to, it, it's football. Like, like it's not going to, I just, so I, to, to say that happened, man, I think that the, a group of guys being together like that will probably never happen again. So I can never see that type of thing happen again. Well, Casey, we really are super appreciative of your time. I want to let you run, but thank you again for making the time to talk about that team and that group of guys that really was more than just 2008 and Super Bowl 43, but it happens to be the 15th anniversary of that, uh, was really the Steelers of the 2000s and early 2010s. Uh, we appreciate your time and can't thank you enough. Oh, absolutely, man. Anytime, brother. Great stories from Casey Hampton looking back on the 2008 Steel Curtain defense, the black and gold, their last Super Bowl title 15 years ago. It's the main reason we're looking back right now on that year here on Oh Mama, brought to you by South Hills Kia. I'm Chris Mack. Next week, we, of course, keep it on the defensive side of the ball because that's the point of this whole thing, looking back on the 2008 Super Bowl team. And we go into the outer edges of things. What do I mean by that? A guy who had a huge impact on the edge as one of the bookends for the fearsome Steelers pass rush of the 2008 Super Bowl team. Lamar Woodley will join us next week. Again, if you've missed any of the episodes, feel free to go back and check them out. They're all posted to the 93.7 Fan YouTube page. It's all thanks to our good friends at South Hills Kia. The latest episode of Oh Mama, a look back at the 2008 Black and Gold Defense, always available right here on the 93.7 The Fan YouTube page.